Well, I don't feel like I deserve any of that introduction, but thank you so much. It's a, a, a pleasure and an honor to be here. I'll tell you that, that maybe Professor Levy feels he learned something from us in 2003, but I'd say through the years we've learned far more from him. Uh, and, and much of that in part was due to his exper free experimentation and his students here at Gordon College. So, <laughs> so thank you. Oops. I left this picture up because I took it this last summer. I watched the total eclipse from this meadow up in the Cascade Mountains, not too far from where I live, and, and I put it on as my, my desktop today because I realized that this place is called Gordon Meadow. So I guess it was meant to be. And it's really beautiful, and unfortunately, right now it's very smoky there because forest fires are burning throughout Oregon, but we will hope that they stop soon. So I'm really happy to have a chance to talk with you about this. I left administration after 10 years of being on what Oregon calls the dark side, and I've returned to the faculty in, in the chemistry department. I'll be teaching a course in our honors college next term on this topic, and so this is kind of my mini introduction to the topic and, and, and a test run on students who don't get to give me formal evaluations to see what you think. I tend to walk around a fair bit, especially since I don't have my slides in front of me, so I'm going to take a peek over my shoulder every now and then. Brief overview of what I'd like to talk with you about is to talk about sustainability, a topic that I think probably doesn't need much introduction here, and I won't spend much time on it. And then talk about sustainable chemistry. I could say even more of the same here. Professor Levy and his colleagues have done a great job, I'm sure, of informing the campus community. And then I'm going to turn to the, the topic, at least nominally, of my title, namely, how do we, how do we make decisions? Um, how do we make decisions for ourselves? How do we make decisions? Can we make decisions for ourselves alone, or do we, our decisions always impact others? Um, and particularly, how do we make decisions about sustainability? And then I'm going to turn to the topic of green chemistry, which has been my focus for really a shockingly long time now. Thank you for letting me know that it's been 20 years since I started in this. Um, and see how that impacts our decision making in general and our decision makers as students or as teachers in the field of chemistry or science in general. And then finally, I'm going to turn to my, my current focus and will probably be my emphasis until my career ends, which will be, I hope, never. Uh, and that's using green chemistry as a way to bring science experimentation to the world regardless of where people might be or how much or how little they may have. Here's one of the classic definitions of sustainability, the so-called Brundtland Commission definition, where basically we look at our needs, our wants and desires, and the best way we can achieve those things without impacting the ability of future generations to have those same opportunities. We typically look at the three pillars or the, the triple bottom line of social, environmental, and economic impacts. And if I look at that in more detail on this next slide, you start thinking about the implications of these things, maybe in the, in the field of education, and, and you recognize that we cover pretty much everything a university might offer its students. So these will slowly fill in here, but these are some of the, the areas at the University of Oregon, all of which carry a, a, a substantial sustainability or environmental flavor the way they're, they're practiced and taught at the University of Oregon. Even the social sciences, I learned that by being yelled at by a department head when I was sitting with a group of, of department heads and talking about how Oregon is so awesome in terms of chemistry and architecture and law and all these different fields that were that cared about sustainability and she happened to be a sociologist and, and informed me of what I should have known about, namely the field of social justice and environmental justice, a field you all know very much about. I will say that that top term energy in my mind, remains the most important thing we worry about. Without reliable, sustainable sources of energy, in the end, I don't know that any of this all matters. I wish I had the solution for that for you today, but we'll have to talk about other things. If we think about a definition for sustainability chemistry, I just took the definition of sustainability and, and, and put chemistry in its place, and that really works pretty well. 
You've seen this definition as well, I'm sure, through your, your time here at Gordon College, but green chemistry has been defined slightly differently, a little more focused on the chemistry part rather than the, than the more generalized sorts of terms, but really the same idea. How can we do chemistry in a way that accomplishes what we want while not destroying our opportunity to accomplish those things? And this definition I liked, it's an awful lot of words. I know you shouldn't put that many words on a slide, but I also know that while I'm talking, you'll be reading it anyhow. So, so while you're doing that, focus on the, air, the words in red. because so I took this relatively simple definition and highlighted all the things that I think make this sound like an area that's worthy of pursuit, of academic pursuit, of social pursuit. It's an area of innovation. Well, we all like to think about new ideas and new concepts. That's kind of what we're in the business for, so that's great. Um, it brings the chemical industry into things. Well, if we'd simply talk about things in the university and don't worry about how chemistry is practiced, we're not going to accomplish a whole lot. We worry about the, the danger of chemicals or the safety of chemicals. We worry about the environment, renewable resources, and a life cycle. So all these things, you know, almost the entire paragraph I had to highlight in red because each of them is an important academic pursuit. Unfortunately, sustainability is complicated. And I, I meant to choose this picture just to show a complicated decision grid, and it actually turns out to be pretty relevant, but don't, don't worry about the details. It's just a graphic to say that how we make decisions about sustainability is unfortunately not a simple thing. It's really, really complicated. For example, how many of you have had discussions about paper versus plastic bags, okay, or cloth bags, reusable cloth bags as well? One of my colleagues, Dave Tyler, uh, carried out detailed analyses. Others have done the same things, and, and the bottom line is, well, Eugene, Oregon, where I live and work, where the university is, banned plastic, banned paper bags. Let me get it right. Banned plastic bags. Because plastic bags are bad, right? Well, if, if you look at some of the key metrics, I'm not going to use the laser here, the amount of energy that's consumed to prepare a, a paper bag versus a plastic bag, just focus on the two left-hand columns, the reusables we won't talk about. Uh, it actually takes a lot more energy. Making paper is a very expensive process, and it's a very polluting process. It uses a lot of water, a lot of energy. It creates more greenhouse gas. So on these simple metrics, actually, the plastic bag is preferable to the paper bag. So why did Eugene ban plastic bags? Well, probably because of things like this. All metrics aside, how do we feel about plastic versus paper when we see pictures like this? And I just put this last one in today. It just appeared last week as, as one of National Geographic's most impactful photos of the week. And it impacts me in a really bad way seeing that little seahorse hanging onto a plastic Q-tip in the ocean. This is a picture of where that seahorse might have found a little bit of plastic to cling onto. These are the so-called plastic islands in the Pacific, which are, on varying estimates, larger than the state of Texas. Maybe I don't care so much about metrics anymore. Maybe it's a gut thing, but this is complicated. How do we, how do we weigh, in the end, those energy costs, those environmental costs, and these costs? Well, it may be difficult, but that doesn't mean we shy away from it. And it doesn't mean it's not a solvable issue. Okay. Dryzak is a, is a formal academic, talks about that complexity doesn't mean we can't solve the problem. Ralph Marston is something more of, a, of an inspirational speaker, but I like his comment as well. If it's a complicated problem, when we say it's too complicated, I can't solve it, then it doesn't get solved. So it's our willingness to tackle with these to tackle these complex ventures that is really what's at issue here. So as we turn to this idea of decision making, and I'm going to be pretty free form with it, 
we're really faced with the question of, of how do we make simple decisions that influence only ourselves. And as I started thinking about how I teach this Otters College class, I was thinking, what, what would be a simple decision? Thought, well, do you want chocolate or vanilla? What difference does that make? It's, it's totally up to me. That's an easy one. It doesn't take much thought. I don't think we go through formal game theory analyses or anything else to reach that conclusion. We just decide what we want. Are there such decisions? Apparently so. Although I started to think, what if you're with your friend and your friend really loves chocolate and there's only enough left for one person to get it? That's not very complicated, but it's a little more complicated, but it starts to bring on that slope of, of more and more complexity to your decision making. So can we make decisions that impact ourselves? And, and that, what do we do about making these more complicated ones? I had this slide in in part because I like the source. It came from the Army War College. Uh, and thinking about decision making from that context just struck me as unusual. Uh, but I took just a couple of their highlights the idea of moral reasoning in warfare is an intriguing thing. We could have a nice discussion about that, I imagine. But what I really appreciate is their point that, that we, we have fewer and fewer black and white decisions and we have more options about maybe or maybe not. And, I, and I'm gonna do my best to stay away from politics, but I will say that in our country today, I, I think there's a real push toward more binary decisions. If you're not this, then you're that. If you're kneeling, then you're not standing. If you're American, you're not. Uh, I think we need not to lose the complexity of all of this. One of the key things in decision making, one of our, uh, Professor Levy's and my good friends, Tom Goodwin from Hendricks College, used to talk about green paralysis, where he'd say, I'm a teacher, we're doing things. I wanna do things more safely. But if I think about doing this, then I start worrying about what the implications of that are, and I can't get to a point where I feel I can make any move without worrying about making things worse. But if we wait until we have the perfect solution and do nothing until then, we're missing opportunities. The real key in, in, in whether it's army strategy or sustainability is to recognize to the best of our ability ways to do things better. And once you're doing something better, then you make better still. So you don't wait until you have the perfect to try to make it good. Okay. And the key thing we need to avoid through all that, of course, is to try not to make it worse. So let's talk about some simple decisions and see if we can reach some conclusions about how we make decisions. If you're an athlete, guess which one in that picture is the athlete, uh, and you decide to take steroids. Guess which one decided to take steroids? The one who's twice as big as all the other people. Okay. What's the, let's do a benefit risk analysis. What's the benefit to that person for taking steroids? Well, there's so many of us, I don't think we're gonna engage in, in discussion, though I intend to do that with the Honors College, with the small group. You know, the obvious benefit is you do better. And what's the risk? Well, you might get caught, but you know, in soccer, it's no whistle, no foul, and athletic other competitions the same way, you'll probably get away with it, so why not? You might get heart disease, but you were a champion, so it's worth the risk. Does that choice have an impact on others? And this was kind of fun to think about this, and I hope in general you'll find that it's kind of fun to think about these things. Well, there's a benefit for, for the observers. They get to watch people slinging weights farther distances or slugging 500 home runs or whatever it might be. And you know, what's the risk to the observers? Well, probably not. If you're a competitor, there's a risk. That is, if you don't take the steroids, somebody else who is is probably gonna do better than you. Uh, but if you're just an observer, you get a better performance, and these poor people may be sacrificing their health, but you don't think about that too much. They won the game, so, so there's no risk. Well, what about that? These aren't therapeutic doses, but if you live in a major city, there are enough steroids or steroid metabolites in, this, in the city water to be detectable. So what are the long-term implications of that? I 
right on stage I'm, I'm before I think about that. And this is just steroids. Here, I had to put this in because I, I glanced at Facebook this morning and one of my friends had just shared this article. Salmon they're catching in the Puget Sound off of Seattle have more than detectable amounts of many things in them, you could read below. Um, they're estimating 97,000 pounds of drugs like this are entering the Puget Sound every year. Someone asked on the way down to the lecture hall how the salmon are doing in, in Seattle, and I said, I'm not sure about numbers, but they seem relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> what, are we, what are we doing to ourselves? Here's another one, thalidomide. How many of you have heard of thalidomide? A fair number. I'll bet most of you are chemistry majors because we frequently talk about thalidomide. It was a drug introduced quite some time ago for treating morning sickness. It made you feel better. Unfortunately, uh, that feeling better in the morning while you were pregnant led to maybe you and your child not feeling so well afterward because they were horrible side effects, birth defects associated. This is one of the more palatable pictures that I could show you. People with hands coming directly out of their, their torso or no legs, or, and, and again, those are some of the least of it. It all turned out to be due to one of two enantiomers of thalidomide. There are two molecules related like a right and left hand. One of them showed anti-morning sickness. The other did this to, to fetuses uh, in utero. Uh, so thalidomide became a classic example for chemists to talk about the importance of, of chirality and handedness of molecules, um, but also for us to talk about the dangers of, of chemistry in practice. What about now? Thalidomide has been found to be very effective for treating some rare forms of cancer or this leprosy-related disease. Uh, and it's on the market again. Not advised for pregnant women, okay? Because I don't think we've gotten better at ensuring that there is none of that undesirable version of the molecule in the, in the medicine. But if you have one of these cancers or, or leprosy diseases, then there's an opportunity. Phthalates and plastic. You had Terry Collins here as part of this lectureship, I imagine. This is one of his great passions. The benefit of phthalates in plastics, and it doesn't matter if you know what they are or not, is it makes softer plastic so your baby can chew on it. It's a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, those phthalates leach out of the plastic and they're powerful endocrine disruptors. And again, I tried to take a picture that was, that was more palatable than some of the, of the five-legged frogs that started appearing, apparently due to endocrine disruption. This is a long-standing impact that could change the, I'm not even going there, that'll be too depressing. But, uh, but these are things we as humans um, and citizens on this planet need to worry about. DDT, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring was all about DDT. Well, DDT was a very, very effective pesticide for, for, for uh, malaria-bearing mosquitoes. They used to spray DDT through big trucks going down my street when I was growing up, and we thought it was really cool to go play in the mist. And I'm still here, so, so but, but we don't calculate risk based on one person's experience. Uh, yes, it saved millions of lives from malaria, uh, but it was leading to the silent spring. The initial impact was, was the destruction of, of shells and you know, of endangered birds that Rachel Carson commented on. This particular decision was a good idea, a good concept, bad in practice, um, and it's one where you can actually make things better. You can make mosquito nets. I sleep under these when I travel in, in Madagascar, uh, and they don't cost very much, and it turns out if, if mosquitoes don't bite you, they don't give you malaria. If they could only invent portable nets for the daytime so the dengue fever if mosquitoes don't bite you, that would be a good thing too. One more, bioethanol from corn. This is it, right? Fuels from, from renewable feedstocks. This is the way to go. We can make ethanol from corn 
and power the planet, and, and where do plants come from? They take CO2 and they convert it to the stuff that we convert to ethanol, so it's a closed cycle, and, and we'll stop global warming, everything will be great. What's, what's the downside of that? Well, what else do we use corn for? We, you know, among other things, we eat it. So we're losing a food source. There are environmental impacts that I'll show you on the next slide. Um, in Mexico, this became so dramatic that the prices for corn for turning it into ethanol went up so much that more people were planting corn, not to turn into fo food, but to turn into fuel. Um, and, and horror of horrors, they, they stopped planting tequila agave plants and planted corn and said, and the prices of tequila went way up. <laughs> Here's the environmental impact. To grow corn, we need fertilizer. We're not very good at fertilizing things, it turns out. We're good at putting fertilizer on land. We're really bad at having the plants thank us for, for providing that fertilizer and using it. Most of it runs off in rain and irrigation, ends up in rivers that eventually channel down to the oceans. And here's a picture, and now this is several years out of date, but the dead zone, the hypoxic zone in the, in the Gulf of Mexico increases steadily year by year. And we're killing a lot of fish because it turns out fish like oxygen in the water. Does this mean we can't use biofuels? I don't think so. Does it mean that maybe there's a, a future for someone, like maybe someone in the audience, to come up with better ways to fertilize our plants so that we don't fertilize the Gulf of Mexico instead? I think that would be a terrific field of research. So let's, I'm going to start switching gears more quickly now to try to move us into education and, and academia. Decision making in the chemical industry. If industry says we need to work with dangerous chemicals, but we're going to be smart, we're going to put scrubbers, we're going to have our, our, our employees wear appropriate uh, safety gear, personal protective gear, PPG, I guess they call it, then we can make what we want, we'll keep our workers safe, un unless we screw up. If we punch a hole in a glove, or the respirator fails, or the, or the scrubber fails, then we're gonna release hazardous materials, we might have exposure to those materials, um, and security is something we don't necessarily think about, but you do if you're a chemical industry. When they're planning for what happens if terrorists attack, you can bet that the, the companies with, with lots of toxic chemicals are worrying about how secure their facilities are. It's not, a, not an example of that, but if you look at the, the flooding in Houston just recently and the, the amazing pictures of peroxide tanks exploding, that's what happens when keeping hazardous materials safe with air quotes around it goes wrong. What other choice could industry make? They could choose to work with intrinsically safer chemicals. They could pay attention to some of the basic tenets of green chemistry. Assuming they can find materials like that will allow th that will allow them to make their desired products. And if so, their workers are protected not by safety implementations, but by the fact that they're working with things that are safe. In the process, they have the potential to make more money. They have the PR of saying we use green processes. They can comply with regulations. This is another very old number, but DuPont was estimated some years ago to be spending a billion dollars on basic research and a billion dollars on regulatory compliance. If they were working with things that didn't require them to worry about regulations, could they spend that extra billion dollars on research instead? And you can save the planet at the same time. I don't know what the risk of these things is. I'll tell you, my son is working as a chemist in the pharmaceutical industry, and although I only briefly had him work in my research lab, um, he talked regularly with me about green chemistry, and he is in his first year at, at this major pharmaceutical company bringing to them ideas about enzymatic catalysis, about safer reagents, um, and he's, within his first year, had his boss's boss's boss grab him in the hallway, put his arm around him, and say, you're doing good work. I got a phone call a few years ago from one of our former undergraduates. He's standing here in the lower left. Peter wanted me to come up to Portland because he was about to run a, a process using eight 1,000-gallon reactors. 
Uh, and that process was using a technique he learned in our green chemistry laboratory for bromination of alkenes. Doesn't matter if you know what that is or not. It was a silly little experiment we did. It's actually a pretty nice one. It teaches a lot of important lessons about chemistry, about sustainability, about green chemistry. But it was a teaching experiment, except that his company had a process that required a bromination. And he decided to try our method, and it worked really well. His company had been in the news about a year earlier because they blew something up. And they were on the waterfront in downtown Portland, Oregon. I have to identify that here on the East Coast, I guess. Yeah. And they had to evacuate part of Portland, and they made the front page of the newspaper, and it wasn't really very good publicity for them. So he wanted me to come up to see this because they had done this process, and the president walked around the plant with me as I watched this in action and said, you know, before if we were doing this reaction and we made a mistake, we were going to be on the front page of the paper again. But now if we drop a cask of something we're using, we'll just throw some sodium bicarbonate on it and we'll call it good. So they had a safer process. It turned out that they were using cheaper reagents. Their product was a higher quality. It was an intermediate and a multi-step synthesis. They were generating less waste and less hazardous waste. They had a contract price for their final product that was so much per pound, it didn't say, unless you save money, then we'll pay you less. So they saved money, and they got paid the same, so they made more money. Peter got a promotion, and I can't find anything about any of that that sounds like a bad idea. So what about colleges and universities? Where does decision-making enter in here? Well, you all decide where you're going to go and what you're going to study. And then we kind of take over from there and say, OK, if you're going to be a chemistry major, you've got to take these classes. And we decide what you're going to learn in those classes. So in lecture, we present things as appropriate. And in the laboratory, we make choices for you about what you're going to work with and what hazards you may or may not be presented with. I need to try to keep track of time. I usually tell too many stories and I run really late, so I'm sorry. There was an experiment in chemical, uh, Journal of Chemical Education a while back with that title. And it makes me a little nervous, although I'm old school and I grew up identifying unknowns by sniffing them. <coughs> Never intentionally tasted them, though I can tell you what some compounds taste like. And I didn't you know, do sound, so the sound's an interesting thought. This chemical wasn't, the one at the bottom, wasn't in that experiment, but it reminded me of when I was a new assistant professor at USC, and I was teaching lecture, and someone else was teaching laboratory, and, and we had a qualitative identification course where you get compounds and have to figure out what they are, and we were being sued by a student and her parents because she had dutifully sniffed her compound a bunch of times because yeah, it kind of smells like something. I better sniff it again. Uh, didn't identify it, finally figured out she'd been given acrylonitrile. And her parents were smart enough to figure out that acrylonitrile is a, is a known human carcinogen. And somebody had given her a human carcinogen in liquid volatile form and said, take a sniff, see if you can tell what it is. Really? Really? <laughs> Sometimes it's staggering, the, the ignorance that we've brought to our profession. Decisions we make in a laboratory. We've got two continuums, continui, I'm not sure what the plural might be. Uh, we have awareness of safety and regulation of exposure, and we have the intrinsic safety of materials. If we work with dangerous things and we don't tell you about them, it's probably not a good idea. If we work with dangerous materials and we say be careful, and you are careful, sure, why not? This is how most of us grew up, actually, Maybe the older folks grew up over in the, in the skull side. If we work with safe things and teach you how to work with them safely, we get a double happy smile, although I didn't find one of those. And if you screw up, you forget your gloves or you take a sniff, we're still OK. And the real concern is if we make the decision to go to the top right and say, we're going to work with dangerous things, because chemists work with dangerous stuff, so you need to know how to do it and we say, be careful, and then you're not, then, then we have a problem. And believe it or not, new students doing chemistry for the first time aren't always absolutely careful. Old professors doing chemistry for the last time aren't always particularly careful either. <laughs> okay. 
we might make a mistake. And if you're working with dangerous things, a mistake can be a bad thing. I like to use pictures. You talk about, if you're doing laboratory work, you've probably talked about working at or working in a fume hood. The fume hood is this ventilated thing that sucks the vapors away and makes it safe for you. But if you, if you do a Google search for working in a fume hood, sooner or later you, you find the picture of what you're looking for. <laughs> and you know, this is a new fume hood, he was safe, but, but again, I don't want to use too many chemical terms, but I've, I've done things in fume hoods with apparatus chromatography columns that are high enough that you can't really reach the top from, in, from outside. So you climb inside the fume hood to put solvent on. Suddenly that, that thing isn't protecting you from the vapors anymore, it's kind of putting you in a concentrated exposure zone. So, so environmental controls, avoiding exposure to dangerous things is a risky endeavor. You might expose yourself. You might expose others or at least the environment. There was a classic thing at Stanford when I was an undergrad in a research lab when someone down the hall was working with cyanide and, and all the pigeons on the roof died. I guess he didn't have a good scrubber set up. Okay. If we want to do experiments with those sorts of things, we're going to need facilities to provide safe handling of those things. We're going to need fume hoods, for example. They're expensive, really expensive to operate. We might be exposing you to hazards. We will be unless we teach you to reliably always do the right thing and never have accidents. And by definition, accidents are things that just happen, right? Um, and, and how many schools are going to have the facilities, these fume hoods and per, uh, appropriate protective gear and all that to handle these ex experimental things or dangerous things? So the likelihood is that either your school and your teachers are going to make a decision to, uh, it's not too scary to expose you to that, so we're going to go ahead. Or more likely nowadays, they're going to say, we're just not going to do experiments. And, and you can find scholarship that says that computer-based instruction, you do a titration on the, on the computer screen, you learn just as much as you do from doing a titration in person. But I don't believe it. <laughs> Maybe you, you learn the things that people are asking you to demonstrate in their assessments. But in terms of learning science, experiencing science, loving science, or not losing your love of science, uh, you, you need to get your hands dirty. And there are implications of this in elementary, through high school, through community college, through research universities. My focus is, I'll turn to if I don't tell too many stories, urban versus rural, developing countries versus developed. All of these are, are choices that we, in the end, we're making when we make decisions about what chemicals to use. I gotta use that one. Anybody use silver nitrate? Not very many. Do you, do you remember? This is participation. It, when you use silver nitrate, was there anything noticeable that happened, say, within the next day or two? You got black on your hands, right? Because you get silver nitrate. I, I, <laughs> grade school. Dissolve, dissolve in American nickel and concentrated nitric acid mouth pipette. I can tell you what that feels like. And I can tell you how carcinogenic that is, too. Yeah, you're, you get black spots on your skin because you get silver nitrate in your skin, the water evaporates, the silver nitrate's there, it's light sensitive, and over the course of a day or two, light decomposes it, and you get silver metal in these little black deposits. So you come back to, to your class the next day, and your teacher says, you had good technique, you had good technique, and you screwed up because your hands are black. There was an argument on chemical educators' website a few years ago about people, about whether they should use benzene as a, as a reagent in an experiment for introductory chemistry. And people were talking, it's a, it's a, it causes leukemia, okay? It's a demonstrated human carcinogen. People were saying, should we use it? Should we replace it? And, and the, the sentiment in the end was, yes, you should use benzene, but teach students how to work with it safely because they know how, they have to learn how to work with dangerous chemicals. So why did I put this little circle up here? Those black spots are really effective at telling your teacher you didn't use very good technique. I like that a whole lot better than having your teacher say final grades will be assigned in 30 years and I'll find if you got leukemia then you didn't pass. What sorts of decisions are we making for our students? That's insanity. 
just an interesting, don't worry about the details, but I had to show you a little chemistry, right? This is from an undergraduate inorganic laboratory manual talking about how to make cisplatin, a platinum-based drug. It's a really neat experiment. You can learn all sorts of good stuff from it. So, and I'm just going to summarize here. You can teach about balancing equations and moles and stoichiometry, coordination chemistry. It's a chemotherapy agent, so you can introduce that as a special topic. The laboratory involves various techniques that are things we want to teach our students. That's a really good experiment. It's an anti-cancer agent. If you've had any courses te te teaching about chemotherapy, you know that most anti-cancer compounds are, in fact, pretty carcinogenic themselves. When someone has got an acute tumor and you need to cure it or they're not going to live, you don't worry about whether the drug you're giving them to, to kill that tumor is going to give them cancer 20 years from now, because they won't be here 20 years from now. Doesn't mean we don't have room for better and better chemotherapies, but typically chemotherapy agents cause cancer. So does cisplatin. And it has all these other effects that you've been reading about as well. So we've got new students in the inorganic laboratory making this compound. Really? Well, they're only exposed once. What about the poor lab instructor or the stock room people who are in there all week, every week, and do this year after year? So is that really a good experiment? Are, are any of the concepts or techniques we're teaching worth risking getting cancer for? And by the way, since we're a green chemist, it's horrible in terms of the environmental factor. You make about 230 grams of waste for one gram of product. You use energy, but really those aren't the points for this particular example. So let's make less of it. There is a, a movement, there has been a movement to microscale experimentation and then to nanoscale experimentation. There's a general sense that the less you use of something, the safer it is. And that's certainly true. A liter of benzene is not going to be as scary to work with as a milliliter of benzene. On the other hand, a milligram of tetrodotoxin is more than enough to kill everybody here. So just because you don't have much of something doesn't mean it's not a hazard. For example, nanoparticles. It's hard to find. Go, go to the market and look at a, at a sunscreen. And most of them will advertise made with titanium dioxide nanoparticles. Good stuff. Okay. They're tiny. How can they be bad for you? Okay. So it, then I started reading about all this, and I found this quote that nanomaterials aren't exactly due. Our focus on them is different. But it, it really it struck me. I saw the six, millions, 6 million tons per year of, of nanoparticulate carbon being made every year. And I started thinking, what is what do six million tons of nanoparticles look like? This isn't carbon, right, but it's sulfur. This is at a, a, a plant in Vancouver, British Columbia, and, and I didn't weigh it. And it's probably not six million tons. It's probably not even close to six million tons, but that's a lot of sulfur. And, and I didn't put a scale bar in here, but, but you know, that's not a nanometer. So six million tons of nanoparticles is a bunch of, what do we know about nanoparticles? Well, increasingly we know that they may be small, but they're not benign. They could do nasty things. I imagine Jim Hutchison, when he was here last year, if you heard him speak, probably talked about safety or lack of safety of nanoparticles, including titanium dioxide, which we're releasing into the environment in, in staggering quantities. So, although we might be tempted to think the smaller the scale, the safer, really what we need to think about is that there's a continuum of risk across the scales. You could work with a whole lot of sand, and unless you bury yourself in it, you're probably pretty safe. And you could work with a really tiny amount of potent neurotoxins and already be dangerous. Important thing, I'll come, this comes back really to the idea of, of stepwise improvement, is let's not make mistakes. Let's not generate the next equivalent of chlorofluorocarbons that led to the destruction of the ozone layer, which is getting better, and, and we won't talk politics again, but people are saying, well, what about the ozone layer? You're not complaining about that anymore. And well, for 20 or 30 years now, we phased out chlorofluorocarbons and replaced them, so it, apparently it's working. Thank God we can do something. Okay. 
let's not make tetraethyl lead again as an additive for gasoline. Interestingly, both of those things, chlorofluorocarbons and tetraethyl lead, were invented by the same chemist who won the Priestley Medal, America's highest honor, a fellow named Thomas Midgley. And my version of the Yogi Berra quote is to say what I've written there, we need to know more about what we're doing before we try to get there. Unfortunately, these days, we know a lot about toxicology, predictive toxicology, environmental fate, all these things. We don't have to make decisions like tetraethyl lead or chlorofluorocarbons. So green chemistry, how we doing? I think we're okay. I hope you've all heard about all this, but if not, green chemistry and, and by paying attention to the intrinsic hazards of chemicals rather than just working with dangerous things more safely allows us all to do safe experimentation. We can learn about modern chemistry with the risk maybe of black spots in our hands rather than leukemias. Chemists can learn everything they need from this, I will argue. Um, and maybe most importantly is by experimenting with these concepts front and center in everything we do, we can train the next generation of chemical users. Not the chemists, but everybody else, because we all use chemicals. We still get some objections about teaching green chemistry, though I think by and large they've passed, but when we first started, everybody said, well, you can't do that because chemistry is dangerous. You know, these sorts of warnings and fires and things, this is, honestly, you talk to old chemists, we're kind of proud of the stuff we did. I still tell stories about when I was a postdoc and I reached into a fume hood to adjust a stirrer with my left hand because if it exploded, I'm right-handed and I'd still have my good hand. It's not a real good way to do business. Okay. But you have to, because chemists work with the stuff. So I teach 350 kids in my organic chemistry laboratory. How many of them do you suppose become practicing chemists. Don't ask me, because I don't know, but it's, but it's not very many. Okay, I'll skip that for now. They do this stuff. They're taking organic chemistry because they have to, to get into medical school or nursing school or pharmacy or dentistry school. It's a requirement. Um, and you know these people aren't gonna work with stuff that blows up. Although I wouldn't mind if we taught them to recognize things for the hazards, and that's something they will be taught if we use green chemistry. I use my poor dentist, as actually he's retired now, so I don't have to worry about his reputation. Uh, but I one time had a cold sensitive tooth. And you know how hard it is to figure out which one it is, but you know how good dentists are at torturing you. So, so he took a bottle of cold off the shelf and, and, and got some cold on, his, on a ball of cotton and went around until he made me scream, and, and that was the one. And, and I said, remember the tooth, but tell me, I, I've, never, I've never seen cold in a bottle before. How do you, how do you get that? So he, he showed me the bottle. It was a bottle of ethyl bromide, which is a volatile compound. It evaporates, and you know that the warm molecules evaporate and cold is left behind. It worked really well. It's a primary alkyl bromide. Methyl bromide is regulated as a carcinogen, and ethyl bromide isn't very much different. It's a little slower in SN2 reactions, but don't worry about that. He was using something that's probably a carcinogen to find my cold sensitive tooth. I suggested to him that maybe, maybe we could not do that next time. And next time I was in and I still had the tooth, he, he used another piece of cold that was called ice. <laughs> that works pretty well. If he had been taught green chemistry from the start, he would have never thought of taking a bottle of a carcinogen and sticking some in his patient's mouth. Okay. Same for these other folks. One of the other complaints we got when we first started was, there isn't any green chemistry out there we can't teach. We've got to use the old experiments from 100 years ago because we, we just don't have anything else. There are all sorts of resources out there now. Okay. Our book, which, which Professor Levy graciously showed, is one. There are many others as well. So that excuse isn't there. People said the experimentation isn't modern. The non-chemists, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about this. I just wanted a picture for the chemists who needed desperately to see some chicken wire structures. This is one, a set of experiments from our textbook. That's really modern chemistry. It's got palladium catalysis, which is something that you can't open an issue of a journal anymore without seeing. In fact, it's hard to find a synthesis of any molecule without using palladium catalysis somewhere. And, and we teach that to our students. 
They get a great experience. They, they take a wonderful natural product, vanillin, in one of these iterations and make a natural product coming out of it. So it, it's really cool, really modern chemistry. It's so cool that we started teaching workshops to introduce people like Professor Levy to what we did. We wanted to make sure that they could do our experiments and they worked so that they didn't get home and then, and then say, well, the green stuff doesn't work. I was teaching a workshop in the Yucatan. We took one of our experiments from the ACS references, Greener Approaches book. Here's the title of the paper. It was created an experiment from John Warner, who probably also has visited here at some point, one of the myriad fathers of green chemistry. Nobody did the experiment in our whole week. And so I said, what, what's the deal? It's a terrific experiment. Why aren't you doing this? And my daughter took this picture. She was 10 years old, and it's a great way to get good pictures. The answer is in the back of the picture, this rotary evaporator. The experiment called for the reaction to be done in toluene. Then you use the rotovap to remove the toluene, did a recrystallization. These teachers were from rural Central and South America. They didn't have rotary evaporators and they're never going to have rotary evaporators because they cost too much. So they said, why, sh why should we do that experiment? It's just going to make us feel bad. It's like when the dish television, satellite television installer came to my house and, and we had decided to splurge for it. He said, we don't have a satellite line. We, we can't spot a satellite. You can't have dish. So we canceled and I got the phone call from the salesman trying to talk me into getting dish because why would you cancel? And I said, look, you know, I want it. I want to do this experiment, but I can't have it. You're just making me feel bad. Okay. So, so I, I, at this workshop, played with the experiment, and in the end found that we could do the experiment without any toluene as a solvent. I also replaced the recrystallization solvent from methanol, which is, you don't, why would you drink it? But it's, it's not as safe as ethanol, which you shouldn't drink either. Uh, and I ended up getting my most cited, most requested paper out of worrying about the fact that these teachers in rural Latin and South America couldn't do the experiment. So saving money not only made it more accessible, it made it better. This is what I started thinking about the economic costs of experimentation. This is my friend Mohammed Hujarat from the era. Arab Academic College for Education. Some of you could think about bringing it out sometime. He's a remarkable educator. He's experimented with his kids from when they were born, pretty much, and they've been doing chemistry experiments through their entire lives. He does various fascinating things. One I'll tell you a little bit more about in a few minutes, but he does it with things that are cheap or free, like film canisters. Something. Anybody remember film canisters? Probably not anymore, but they used to be cheap and free. Uh, or free, and batteries, and uh, doing electrolysis and other things, doing fantastic experiments with stuff that was very inexpensive. Peter Schwartz, a, a high school teacher in Germany, takes it one step further. He uses trash to do chemistry. He uses old water bottles, um, milk containers, and things like that. He gets ampules from hospital dispensaries. I don't think we would do that in this country, but okay. We were at a workshop in, in Kuwait at a very fancy hotel, and at the fancy hotels, they've got little jellies in glass bottles. Everybody at the workshop was having, for breakfast, they'd have massive quantities of toast with jam because they'd take these little bottles and turn them into alcohol lamps to do chemistry experiments later. And this turns me now, I'm starting to worry about time, but I think we're pretty good. My, my focus now is, has taken green chemistry one step further from the benefit of learning in the Yucatan about accessible experimentation, we, I want to, and what I do is work with local schools, local teachers, learn what they are interested in having their, their students experience, learn what they have or more likely what they don't have, and then in collaboration with those teachers and students develop content for science education. So for example, here's Here's uh, Muhammad's electrolysis. Short version, you electrolyze sodium chloride solution with olive oil on either side. Olive oil's nice from Israel, which is where Muhammad's from. Uh, at one side, you make hydrogen. The other side, you make oxygen. But you also make acid and base. I'm just going to use my, my finger here. This side, you're making base. And the olive oil is getting hydrolyzed, saponified, 
into fatty acids and there's bubbles of hydrogen going up through it, so it, it turns, it makes soap bubbles. At the other side, you're making oxygen. You can see bubbles there, but you're also making chlorine because you've got sodium chloride in solution. Chlorine bubbles up, reacts with the olive oil to halogenate it. And you've heard of polybrominated vegetable oil. Well, polychlorinated is very similar. It turns into like margarine, and you can see the white stuff at the top. We were doing that. I was in Thailand thinking about flower pigments because my Mexican collaborator, this is going to get complicated for a second, likes to use colors, and he uses hibiscus flowers to make the colors in the Mexican flag, red, white, and green. That was convenient in Kuwait because the Kuwaiti flag is red, white, and green. It was almost convenient in Israel where the flag is blue and white, except I was working with the Arabs, and the Palestinian flag is red, white, and green, so we were able to pull that off again. But I do a lot of work in Thailand. Their flag is red, white, and blue. For that matter, I work in this country, red, white, and blue, and I was frustrated that we didn't have blue. But I learned about the Thais liking to drink something made from this butterfly pea, this bright blue thing. They do a, a water extract to make tea, and they serve it by squirting lime juice into it, and it changes color. So I figured you know, there, there should be some good color chemistry there. So I set up the electrolysis. I put some of the, the butterfly pea pigment in so it was all blue at the bottom. Some people, when they do experiments and demonstrations for hundreds of people, practice them ahead of time, and I just, I just did it cold. I had never tried it. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I set it up, and the first thing that happened was I was generating chlorine. Chlorine's a bleach. The blue color went away, and I just saw blue and then colorless. So I was disappointed. I said, oh, well, it's an experiment. Experiments are meant to determine things that we don't know, so now we know, and I just ignored it was talking, and over the next half hour, it was turning away, and eventually, I looked back, and, and by, by golly, it was red, white, and blue. The blue remaining here, the red, because at this electrode, we were generating acid, and it, just like squirting lime juice, it turned to the red color, and it was white, colorless at the top, because the chlorine had bleached it. At the other side, by the way, we make yellow and green, so I can still handle the, the Kuwaiti or the, the Mexican flag and a couple of other African countries as well. And that meant a lot to them because all those kids drink Dan Dokkan Chan when they're at home. Started talking about locally relevant material in the West Bank of Israel, and we started thinking about things like this. I think I'm just going to move on in the interest of time and say that my latest focus is the island of Madagascar off the southeast coast of Africa. I'm working in two areas there on humanitarian ventures. One is putting in water supplies outside the city of Ansarabe, and the other is I help to build a church in a tiny little village way down here near the Rainforest National Park. Madagascar, those are typical pictures. They don't have very much, in fact, Average person makes about 75 cents a day. They, were, they got nothing. So how are you going to teach science here? Well, what, is, what does nothing look like? Oops. <laughs> that was another picture I just put in. This is the only highway to get to that little village near Ranamafana from, from where you fly in. And, you know, so maybe the truck thought he could carry a little more over that bridge than he thought. This was taken last week, so I'm not quite sure how my trip next month is going to go, but we will see what happens. Being Madagascar, I think they'll have something fixed. Anyhow, here's, here's what nothing looks like. They've got all sorts of stuff. They've got tropical fruits, flowers, where we can think about getting flower pigments. Those are tomatillos. That's a pharmacy in the middle. You could actually get some chemicals through the pharmacy. Spices. Spices are a really rich source of doing interesting chemistry. They make bricks out of mud. So there may be some inorganic or materials chemistry there. They do metal smelting. They use plant extracts as sunscreens. I have no idea what to use that jellyfish for, but I got to figure something out. It was pretty cool. And they do various extracts. So I happen to be in a, in a restaurant. Maybe, maybe there's rum in that glass. And they make rums with various plants in them. And I, and I happened to see my, my college French helped a little bit. I saw hibiscus in French on a, on a bottle. And this indeed is hibiscus extract of rum. And hibiscus flowers is the one thing I found we can use any place in the world. It's, it may be called something different, but hibiscus flowers are absolutely everywhere. Okay, I haven't been to the Yukon yet, but maybe not there. 
but and and it's, it does incredible pH sensitive colorimetric chemistry. You got to do chemistry in stuff. So what's our lab we're going to look like? That's a toothpick holder from a restaurant on the west coast. There's a, a really delightful coffee cup, which was the best part of that cup of coffee, uh, in central <laughs> Madagascar. And here's some kids at one of the water projects playing with a toy. That toy you can't really see, but it's four bottle caps with a nail stuck through them. And he's got a little fork stick, and he's driving his truck around. Well, so they got bottle caps. So maybe bottle caps are our, our beakers. It doesn't have to be an Erlenmeyer flask to be chemistry. And we can make custom glassware. There are wizards at metalworking in Madagascar. This picture down here, there's a gentleman in Ansarabe who makes tourist things out of trash. Those are bicycle cables that he's turning into little bicycles. Um, and this picture on the right-hand side was a truck delivering bricks for the church we built in that little village. We said, why don't you back it up the hill so we don't have to carry the bricks all the way up the hill? And he broke his drivetrain part of which is sitting here, and part sticking out there. Two days drive from a city, 15 minutes later, he backed that truck up the hill and delivered the bricks. They can fix things, they can make things, so I'm not gonna worry about what we're gonna do our chemistry in Madagascar. Okay. This venture was, was meant to be, I think, within a day in this little village, I met the mayor of the village. I met a Frenchman who was waiting five hours, it turned out, for an inner city transit bus to come by. They travel when they're full, and sometimes it takes a while before they fill up. Uh, and I met a gentleman from Stony Brook with a research operation there in the National Forest, and so I suddenly have a circle of people all saying, come back, we've got a laboratory for you, we've got an office for you, we'll be happy to have you work with us. So I'm going back in October. Who cares? Well, you know, the world's a small place, this is a, a small selection of the people I get to work with in these international curriculum development work. And I put flags up from each of them and from others that are involved as well. It's growing. I'm the US representative for the group. I'm kind of excited about that. It's a bigger place than some of these countries. But we basically have one person from each of 15 or 16 different countries working together and meeting regularly. So to summarize, you know, mostly let you read. I should come back to the original topic. We're making decisions all the time as educators about what we're going to do. We're making decisions as human beings about what we're going to do, too. Okay. Let's try to make the right choices, make sustainable decisions. We don't need, when we start making those choices as educators, we don't need special <coughs> facilities to do chemistry experimentation. It means we can do places everywhere. Very importantly to me, we're not just educating the chemists, the small percentage of you that go on to be chemists, but we're educating the people who are going to be, live in a chemically occupied world as well and make smarter decisions. And then this final part, by doing locally relevant experimentation, instead of saying, you know, I'm sorry, we can't teach you because you don't have the stuff that you need to do these great experiments we developed, we developed experiments with them. It gives it both accessibility and relevance. And that isn't just true in, in Madagascar. I took our traditional steam distillation experiment and introduced steam distillation of mint instead of cinnamon and, and cloves, which is what we usually use. Well, peppermint oil is a major Oregon crop. And suddenly, out of my 300 students, I had 20 or 30 who went home to their families and said, you won't believe this, but they actually taught us something that you will think is useful today at school. And to wrap up then, because why not talk about lofty things when we're, we're thinking lofty things? I'll just let you read those. Hopefully you see the relevance to what we're talking about. And then a final picture, we had the Dalai Lama visit the University of Oregon. You can see him wearing the visor here. And this to me is what it's all about. I'm, I'm 61 years old, I'm looking toward the end of my formal career, I suppose. And increasingly, day by day, everything I do needs to make a difference. And, and this is the difference we're talking about. You know, make a difference in your heart, make a difference in your community, make a difference in this community as well. So with that, thank you again so much for your patience.